Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle. I can't tell you why Seasons spinning round again The years keep rolling by Welcome to Story by Story, sharing the human experience. I'm Kate Dudding, your host. Joe Doolittle is off doing something else interesting uh, today. But uh, it's October now, it's fall. And we've started our new season at the Glen Sanders Mansion, and, at, and we're going to be starting our season at Proctor's. But more about that later. Today we have with us a storyteller from Saratoga Springs, Betty Cassidy. Welcome, Betty. Thank you, Kate. I enjoy Betty's stories so much that they're often personal stories or stories set in history or folk tales. She's kind of a switch hitter in the storytelling <laughs> world. But how did you get start, started in storytelling? Well, I was teaching some speech classes at a community college and I thought I wanted to incorporate more about including stories to back up your points. So I heard about this free workshop at the Saratoga Library given by Janine Laverty and I took that workshop on storytelling and I was hooked then. So then after I retired I devoted a lot more time to it and got involved with wonderful things like the Capital District Story Circle and met a lot of wonderful storytellers and just keep going with it and loving every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so about what year was that? It was about nine or ten years, nine years ago. Nine years ago. Yeah. And my first set of formal classes, I'd gone to two conferences, weekend workshop things, but my first set of classes was also with Janine and the Saratoga Springs Library. I think it was uh, spring of 96, so a, a, a little earlier than you, but not, not too much. So what stories speak to you or what, what stories do you feel you have to share? I uh, find, first of all, I have to love the story. Mm -hmm. I try sometimes to love some that I think are good stories, but it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, the stories that speak to me most have to have some kind of connection to today's world. Okay. Um, if it's a folk tale, it usually talks about some weakness in the human personality that I share with them and that most people share with them or if it's got some humor with it. Uh, personal tales, I don't tell too many of them, but I like to tell them, if, again, if, they, if I think they have some sort of universal appeal mm -hmm. as opposed to just some story about my life. Mm -hmm. And um, history tales, I just enjoy telling uh, if they have some fascinating details that I think people should hear or might enjoy hearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so do you actively go out and search or, or for stories? Um, I know Elizabeth Ellis, who was, one of, who was my other storytelling mentor other than Janine, uh, for a while at least she was reading a folk tale a night. She had one of those huge folk tale collections and so she would just read it and, oh, Fran Yardley up in uh, Saranac Lake says that storytelling is like making maple syrup. You read about 40 of them before you find one that you want to, to um, adopt, I guess it is. And it's, that's the 40 to 1 ratio when you're making maple sap, sap to syrup. That's a wonderful analogy because I think I think that's what I do. I, I read a lot of them. I like that part of storytelling. I like the researching, mm -hmm. finding the right story about something, finding something to go with something else. But I, I uh, have stacks of books and things at home, that I, and I just keep, keep reading. And then 
one I didn't like one time sometimes speaks to me differently another time mm -hmm. when I read it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then a story has to kind of sit in my head for a long time before I can do anything with it. Right, and that sitting in, in, in the head, for me, that the difficulty is often, why do I want to tell the story? Because unless I know my intention, it's hard to shape the story, knowing what to include and what to leave out and, and what to emphasize. So some stories are kind of yeah. in got, process for a long time. I have several that have been there too long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they may never go anywhere, but mm -hmm. I, I've got one about deals with friendship and every time I think oh that's what I'll do with it it doesn't work out but someday it will someday <laughs> it's a very it will. slippery sucker yes yes but that's what makes it interesting because mm -hmm. you never get bored with it right right yes I find that too okay well enough of, of talking about stories would you share one of your stories with us and tell us a little bit about it and okay uh, I'd like to share a folktale it's called The Edge of the World. And I like this folktale because I think it's got a little bit of humor and I think it does, as I said before, talk to the human condition. So this is The Edge of the World. <coughs> there was a young man who seemed to have everything he needed in his life. He had a nice house, a nice job, lived in a good place, but he was strange in some ways in that if he got an idea in his head he couldn't figure out or couldn't solve it just drove him wild and he couldn't think of anything else well one day he got on the idea of luck and good luck and people talking about my lucky day or my lucky penny or anything pertaining to uh, if I have enough luck I'll win the lottery or something like that and he couldn't figure out what good luck meant and he thought I've never had good luck I don't know what people are talking about so he went to the wise woman in the village and asked her and she said I can't answer that question for you nobody could answer that unless you go to maybe the king of the gods well where's he he's at the edge of the world well how do I get to him you just get out there and start walking and eventually you'll get to him so he did and he walked a day, a week and a month, and then he came along to a group of wolves playing by the side of the road. And those wolves looked so happy and healthy and they were howling, practicing their howling and rolling around in the dirt. But there was one little tiny wolf, scrawny little guy, about half the size of the others. His hair was all matted down. He just looked awful. He was sitting on the edge watching and he said, hey, mister, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going to find the edge of the, the king of the gods at the edge of the world to answer some questions for me. He said, would you ask him a question for me? Would you ask him why I look the way I do? Look at my brothers and sisters over there. What's wrong with me? Would you find out? And he said, sure, I'll try. And he took off and he went a day, a week, and a month, and he came to a grove of trees, pine trees, beautiful, strong trunks and branches in the pine needles on them were gleaming except just like the last experience one scrawny little tree with branches that went every which way and the needles were kind of brown and falling off at the least little breeze and that little tree said to him hey mister can you help me and he said well what what do you want he said I want to find out why I look the way I do why I can't grow like the other trees and he said, well, I'm going to see the king of the gods. Maybe I can find out. And he took off. Walked that same day, week, and month again. And then he turned. There was a curve in the road. And he came upon this beautiful cottage, gleaming white, with green shutters and planters under the windows, full of bright red geraniums. And in front of the cottage was a picket fence and all kinds of wonderful flowers. And then the door opened and out stepped the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. And she said, oh, I'm so happy to see someone. Come on in and have lunch. So he did. And they chatted and got along. And in the process of, of the conversation, he told her where he was going. And she said, oh, would you ask him a question? Ask him why I'm so lonely and what I could do about it? So he said, oh, sure. And then he went along, left her, 
cottage and he walked that day, the week and the month, and all of a sudden he looked down and there were his toes right at the edge of the world. And he looked around and he looked up and he saw just sky, beautiful blue sky and clouds and sunshine and it was, it was an overwhelming sight. He just stood there and all of a sudden up from somewhere came this big cloud and there was the king of the world strong and tall and wearing a white velvet robe and a crown and gold decorations all over that robe and he said what are you doing here and the young man said well I, I have a question for you what's your question I want to know why why can't I have any good luck why haven't I never had good luck well the king of the gods looked at him and said that's because you're stupid that's why you don't know good luck when you see it. Now get out of here and don't bother me anymore. You just get out of here and you look around. You'll find out what good luck is all by yourself. So the young man didn't know quite what to do. He said, oh, I also have some questions. I know you got questions. I know everything. And he told him the answers to the questions that he had been asked along the way. And he said, now get out of here and go find out what luck is. So the young man left. He could not figure out what what the king of the gods have been talking about, but he started walking day of the week of the month, and then he came to that cottage again. And this time that beautiful girl was out in the garden, and she jumped up when she saw him coming, and she said, oh, you're back. I've been so glad to see you. Come on in, let's have lunch again. And they did, and they got along even better. And she finally said, will you tell me, what, what did you learn? about what I should do about being lonely. And he said, well, I got, I got the answer. The king of the gods said, if you got married, you wouldn't be lonely anymore, so you should find yourself a husband. I should get married. Yes. Well, she said, would you like to marry me? He said, uh, I can't. I've got to go find out something about good luck. But if I see some nice young man along the way, I'll send him back to see if, if he's interested in you. And he left. And he walked till he came to that, that strand of trees again. And that little tree was out there saying, hey, mister, what'd you find out? He said, well, your story is so interesting because it turns out that years ago, years ago, some robbers were trying to escape from the sheriff who was chasing them. They had bags of stolen gold and they didn't know what to do with them. So they dug out around your roots when you were just a little seedling and they buried that gold. And therefore your roots have never been able to grow. Now, if you just dig out the, those bags of gold, then you will start growing and you should get to be as tall as most of those other trees. Well, said the little tree, Mister, would you get a shovel and dig out that gold? Because uh, you can have it all. What, what go good is gold for me? I'll give it all to you if you'll just dig it out of there so I can grow. Well, I'd love to help you, he said, but I got to go find out what good luck is. But if I see somebody who looks strong, I'll tell him to come back and shovel out those coins. And he left and he walked that day, that week, that month, and he got back to the wolves. And that little scrawny wolf was standing there waiting patiently. He said, what did you find out, mister? And he said, well, you got a strange answer from the man, from the king of the gods. Yeah, what did he say? Well, he said, your problem is you don't eat right. If you ate right, you would grow and be strong and healthy. And his advice to you was to go ahead and eat the first healthy, dumb animal that comes along. Are you sure that's what he said? It's exactly what he said. The first healthy, dumb animal that comes along, you should eat him. Okay. And he did. And that's the story of the man who didn't understand good luck. <laughs> oh, Betty.
I've heard you tell that a number of times, and I just love the way you you handle all those voices. First, I I, I wanted to ask you about it because you seem to do it effortlessly, going from because there there's the wolf, there's a the stupid man, there's the old woman, there's the wolf, the tree, the beautiful girl, and the king of the gods. Leave any so what? That's half a dozen people uh, voices, and you just kind of. Well, I, you know, I think that's, I didn't do it that way the first few times I did mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I think as you tell a story several times, it develops and mm -hmm. it grows. And like, I, I, I know what that, I know that tree now and I know that wolf. <laughs> and, right. so, and so I know their voices. So it, it, a story isn't just created and told, mm -hmm. it just grows. It's, it's, and I think that's what, that's what happens okay. with, with, with voices and, and different characters. Okay. With me, I have to, I have a hard time. And so in one of the workshops that I took with my other storytelling mentor, Elizabeth Ellis, um, Modico participates in it. And Modico is a storyteller from Western Massachusetts, but she's also a mime. That was, that was how she got into storytelling. So she suggested that I have a characteristic gesture, which is what she has. And so, so I was recently. I was just telling a, a, a program that had Oscar Hammerstein and Edna Ferber in it. And Oscar had his hand in his pocket, and so well, I would put my hand in my po my invisible pocket and go. Then Oscar's voice could come out, <laughs> and and then Edna's was was up here, and so that she was a little higher than I normally am, and so that would. So I need, for me, I need these physical reminders. But you were just sitting there and just would slip well, right into them. Thank you. But I couldn't have done that if I hadn't told that story many, many right, times. Right, right. It, and it, gotten very aware of the fact that they should sound a little bit different or mm -hmm. it, gets, it mm -hmm. gets boring for people or they, they can't follow. But I think you're right about that. I've, I've done some of the business with trying to do the physical mm -hmm. movements, too. So. Um, I think that's why we love storytelling, too, because we just keep working on these things and finding them a little different for every time and every audience. Right, right, yes, yes, every audience that, well, st story, most storytellers I know like to have their audience in the light, in the actual light, um, so that the storyteller, like for, for me, I like to see people's faces. Mm -hmm. And I get really energized when I see somebody shaking their head or, or you know, even silent laughter will, will charge me up. You know, obviously laughter, laughter does too. But it's, it, I particularly want to be able to see their faces if they go, and, that, and, and that's a little signal to me, oh, maybe I've left something out, or maybe for this audience or that person, I need to stick something in. What did I just say? Oh, you know, I, maybe I used a French term or, you know, whatever it is, but, but looking at people's faces is, is to me very critical in storytelling. Do, do you feel yeah, I, I do, and I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I, as you said that, I thought I did years of that when I was teaching because if the kid in the back of the room was sleeping, obviously I wasn't reaching him. <laughs> or if someone was uh, sort of not not with it, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But and and if that questioning look or that look of mm -hmm. I got it. So I think I think that was kind of good training for storytelling, also. But <laughs> S sort of, I was thinking combative role. That wasn't quite really the term. Uh, <laughs> but you had to maintain. Um, the class, control of the class. Yeah, and you hoped so, you were making some kind of connection right. with the individuals, too. Right. So. Yes. yes. But I love all that business about, I think the, I was just thinking, I told that Edge of the World story, I think, at Celebration one year. Yes. And there were a bunch of kids in the audience. Mm -hmm. And even though I think it was fairly dark, the lights were down a little bit on the audience, I just felt like I was getting waves of approval and fun from the, all these, there were 30, 40 kids mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. all these kids who, and I think I never told that story better or enjoyed telling it more than that, right. that time, so yeah. Yeah. it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's, storytelling is a, it, it's, there's the story, there's the teller and the listener, and they, they're all swirling together in real time. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a creation that's never quite the same 
any other time. Mm. And we're also, as storytellers, very free to make changes. That in the theater, those poor actors, you know, they have to say the words that the playwright wrote. And I mean, they, there's obviously many different ways you can say words, but mm -hmm. those are the words. Whereas we can. <laughs> well, and that's, I think, storytelling is. Uh, is not as powerful if someone has is doing it from a memorized text mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where it's the same all the time because you you lose a little bit of that conversational thing where we change our minds according to mm -hmm. the reaction we're mm -hmm. getting or what we think of to say and so on so uh, and I think audiences also don't listen don't everybody's tied into electronic things so this is a real new experience for them to create their own pictures in their head of what what mm -hmm. the story is like mm -hmm. instead of having the pictures right there for them right there have been studies done and the brain activity between listening to stories and the brain activity that goes on while watching a movie is completely different yeah the brain activity is much more active when people are just listening to a story because they're creating the images in their head. You, you, you go, oh, that reminds me of, and you might take a little, a little personal detour of, you know, that reminds me of, of, oh, you know, maybe my grandmother had an edge to her like that wise woman, mm -hmm. you, know, and, you know, didn't suffer fools uh, uh, gracefully. And so, oh, that, re that reminded me of Grandma Ike. And, you know, you might take, oh, oh, and then, and then come back to your story because, oh, right, I'm missing things. So it's, it's a very dynamic process that I find just. It is. It doesn't wonderful. look like it because someone's just talking <laughs> and someone's just sitting. But a lot is going on there. And I think it's exciting to see an audience react, particularly in these times, because they're not used to doing this. They're used to having everything pretty much there for them. Right. It's almost even pre-digested. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> almost. So, which is not to say I do not love the theater. I mean, I'm a, I'm a subscriber to Capital Rep. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Superior Donuts and, and all the rest of the productions they're having this year. But it's, it's a different art form, and, and um, I love this one. Obviously, that's why I spend my life now doing, uh, involved in it. OK. So is there anything? Oh, so how did you trip across this story? Do you remember? Yes, I saw it in um, some kind of a collection of folk tales, and it said it was a British folk tale. Then I saw a version of it that said it was an Indian folk tale. <laughs> then um, just the other day, I saw some other version of it said, no, it, it said this is a Scottish folk tale or a Canadian, Canadian folk tale. Mm -hmm. So I, the, the basic idea was there several times. And then. Um, Maybe not pine trees in India. It's just a guess. but right. No, no, but <laughs> it, it, it was the same sort right. of idea, right. same concept of the guy going to get answers. To the, and the, the whole idea of that we don't appreciate what we've got. Mm -hmm. We don't even know it's there. Right. It is in several cultures. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I was probably feeling like I didn't appreciate my life that much that day or something uh -huh. when I decided this would be a great story mm -hmm. to tell. Mm -hmm. And I had fun. I kind of had fun with that, getting, getting it organized. Yeah. And I think all of us probably can look back at a time in our life and go, you know, that was really terrific, and I didn't, I wasn't paying attention yeah. to that. And, yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah, so living in the moment and, and being aware of, of what's, what's lucky, and, and it could just be, um, you know, when somebody lets me into traffic, I, 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 I you know, I wave, but I, 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 I mentally, you know, bless them. And I don't know what happens to that, but I think sending blessings to people can't hurt. And appreciating all the little things in yes. life. Yeah, yes. little things like that, yeah. Yes. We're probably just very lucky just 
to drive from one place to another without having a problem. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> right, of all those near-miss accidents. Yes, that, yeah. that, yes, yes. We have had lots of lucky days. Yes, we've had lots of <laughs> yeah. very lucky days that uh, uh, we're coming towards winter and ice always adds that, that little extra. Little tinge. <laughs> yes, of, of, uh, hopefully we'll all be very lucky this, this uh, winter season and not have any. Right. And only very few near misses and only near misses. And lots of someone letting us into traffic. Yes, yes. letting <laughs> us into traffic. And, uh, yes. So that was a folk tale. I, you have another story for us, but of a, a totally different kind of story. Uh, <clears throat> yes, this story um, is sort of a personal story, but I didn't do it intending it to be that way. Uh, back, I think, whenever the first... Iraqi war started. Mm -hmm. there were, I read an article about um, problems, how difficult it was for the families of the soldiers to uh, survive. They missed the people. There were uh, perhaps financial problems. There was uh, a lot of extra responsibility for the, the wife or the husband left behind taking care of children and so on and so forth. And I thought, no, people don't recognize that. They don't remember that. And I just wanted to tell a story that had something to do with that. So then I thought of, I thought of this this incident and turned it into a story. So I call this story the letters. When you walked into the small living room, and then past that into the dining area, on the back wall, it was all taken up with a map of the world as it was in 1944. And on that map, there were a series of thumbtacks. Started up in upstate New York, went down the East Coast to New, to New York City and uh, Norfolk and Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and then over to Chicago and then down in uh, Seattle and um, San Francisco on the West Coast. And one, one thumbtack way out in Hawaii now, those thumbtacks were tracing Pat's places as he served in the Navy in 1944. Pat had been drafted the year before at the age of 35, which at that time was considered quite ancient to be drafted. But the war had been on for a long time, and everybody who could was going. And everyone who drafted was drafted would have been um, probably overlooked if it had ended earlier. But Pat was married to Mary and they had four children. And that's, Mary was living in that house with the map with the four little kids. And every day they would look at that map and trace the thumbtacks and talk about all the places that daddy had been on his little ship in the Navy as part of, as part of the US Naval Fleet. They knew that he was out in the Pacific at this point, uh, but never knew quite, quite where. This was a very tough time for Mary. Um, there weren't any automatic washing machines or uh, interesting uh, kinds of uh, appliances to make life easier then. She also had almost no money trying to live on whatever the allotment was the Navy sent her. Um, she had a huge garden to take care of and all sorts of work, hard work to do. But she was only about 32, and she was tough, and she was convinced she could do this. Uh, having also four children from age seven down was not easy at that time. The thing that kept Mary going, however, were Pat's letters. Now, Pat was a great big kind of gruff guy, but um, he could write a letter that just made you feel good. But this was not email like we're used to today. This was V-mail. They wrote the letters. The, the letters came on sort of tissuey paper. It was just one sheet, but it folded over and made its own envelope. And you only really had the space of one page to write. And then sometimes that was all blacked out if the censors read it and thought there was anything there that would be give damaging information to the enemy. They blacked it out. So you might get a letter that just said, Dear Mary, and how are you? And down at the bottom, as long as it had this, she didn't care if it was blacked out. I miss you. Give the kids a hug for me. I love you, Pat. 
if that was there, she got through that day and waited the next day. Now, every day, she tried not to be too obvious about this, but it seemed like around the time the mailman was going to come, Mary made sure she was in the front room or near the, near the front door so she could peek up the street to see if Joe the mailman was on his way because she was needing those letters to keep going. And if, if Joe didn't have a letter, she'd be out on the porch saying, Joe, are you sure you don't have a letter for me down in that big bag of yours? He'd say, no, Mary. Pat's out there saving the world for us. We can't expect him to have time to write every single day. You'll get more letters tomorrow, I bet you, or the next day. Sometimes these letters get held up, you know. So she'd go in and she'd reread some of the old letters and get through another couple of tough days. And then, all of a sudden, there was a time when there were four days with no letters. And by the fifth day, she was not just looking out the window, she was out sweeping off that front porch six or seven times waiting for Joe to come around the corner. Sometimes in the past, when he was coming around the corner, if he saw her out and had a letter for her, he'd reach in his bag and wave the letter as he walked down the street. But that wasn't happening now. So a week went by and two weeks, three weeks. Joe didn't even want to walk down that street. It hurt him to see how sad she looked. Four weeks, five weeks and no letter. Even those little kids knew something was wrong and they were kind of quiet as kids can sense when they they better be quiet because their mother had other things on her mind. So by almost the sixth week, Mary was exhausted. And this one night, after days and weeks of going through with what if this and what if that, and, uh, what if this has happened and I wonder if he's hurt and I wonder if he's in one of those prison camps and, and, and I wonder if his ship got hit and if he's hurt and so on, she finally figured out that she had to get some rest. So once the children got to sleep, she went to bed and somehow put all those what ifs out of her head and she fell into a sound sleep. And then all of a sudden there was a pounding on the door. She could hear it downstairs and she jumped up and put her robe on and she went into the children's rooms to see if they were sleeping and they were. So she went to the top of the stairs and the pounding stopped. Oh, I must have been dreaming. I must have been having a nightmare or something. And she started back to the room and it, it started up again, pounding and knocking and pounding. And she started down the stairs and it stopped for a second and she stopped. And then it started again and she continued that long walk down the stairs. By the time she got to the last step, she thought she could hear a voice out there calling to her saying something, but she, she couldn't tell what it was, and she finally reached for the door and pulled open the door, and there was Joe, the mailman. And he said, Mary, Mary, we just got a bunch of letters from way back. They were held up from the invasion of the Philippines. Here's six letters from Pat, and I think there'll probably be more tomorrow. And she said, thank you, Joe. And she took those letters and she couldn't move any further than the steps. And she sat there for the rest of the night. She read and reread those letters. Well, Pat got home safe and sound. His ship had been part of the U.S. Naval Fleet at the invasion of the Philippines. That was the time when Mar MacArthur returned. Uh, if you re remember your history. And he came home safe and sound after the war ended. He didn't talk a lot about his war experiences, but every once in a while he would say something that related to that particular time period. And Mary, who usually didn't butt in, when he got to that part, she would always stop him and say, Pat, there were a lot of heroes where you were, but right here, my hero, was Joe the mailman. 
And I know that story well because I was one of those little kids up in the bedroom sleeping when all this happened, and I heard about it over and over again. And that's the letter story. I've heard this a number of times, but I am touched every time I hear it. Because you bring us to that moment so clearly, and you make us feel Mary's pain and desperation and, and Joe's goodness. You know, at, at the beginning when he was, when she was just miss, you know, missing one day of letters, he, he was so kind and reassuring to her. And then, um, then of course, uh, when he shows up in the middle of the night. And she stays up all night with the new letters. Uh. And then I love the surprise, you know, because I remember, I, I'm almost sure the first time I heard you tell it was up at Cafe Lena at one of our storytelling open mics up there. Mm. And so I'm going, oh, she's finished. And then, and then you have that little, that final little, little paragraph on it. And of course I knew that very well because I was one of the little kids. I go, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, but you always forget something. I just realized right at the end of it, I forgot to give Joe enough information because he was working like a second shift at the time and walked all the way down with these letters. And I somehow I looked at the camera once or something, forgot that. Yeah, but I guess yeah. I think, but I think it it holds up anyway yes. as him being a hero. Yeah. That's that's. Yeah. kind of an example of how stories change when you're mm -hmm. telling them in places but yeah yeah I find uh, personal stories hard to do sometimes it took me if I don't tell that story for a while the next time I tell it I, I get teary-eyed about it <laughs> I know <laughs> so yeah you, you have to learn how to back off and let it be a story right. uh, sometimes so yes or or um, I had an experience, I tell it um, to nursing homes quite near my house every month. And I always end by uh, having everyone sing God Bless America. Because even if, you know, the people who have Alzheimer's or the people who are really old and, and haven't seemed to be paying attention, I swear all of them either sing or at least mouth the words to God Bless America. So in September, when I was telling, and it was like September 13th. You know, this is something I've done for several years. And I start singing God Bless America. And all of a sudden, 9-11 flooded back to me. And I remembered, you know, how oh, many yeah. times that was sung after 9-11. Yeah. And, and, and I, it was like... Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's the way it goes. You, uh, we have real emotions, and sometimes they sneak up on us. Mm -hmm. But um, but they carried on when I my voice kind of wavered and so forth. Anyways, that's a wonderful idea, Margaret French, and I tell it. Mm -hmm. uh, Wesley, a nursing home once in a while, but mm -hmm. neither one of us can sing to lead a thing, so maybe ah. we'll find some little tune that we could try, <laughs> yes. or a little or, saying or something. Or, or, or if you have a portable something or other. Yeah, maybe. we could try something. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. But I, I get that same sense and uh, that sometimes when you think, why did I bother today? Because they're not paying any attention. I, I think they are getting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Some it, of it's, it. It, it, it. It's for me. It's a hard gig because there is the lack of feedback that we were, I was just talking mm -hmm. about. You know, having them in the light. Yeah. You know, but um, you can't always tell. You, you can't always tell if you're getting through. right. And uh, Elizabeth Ellis says, "God only gives you enough feedback to keep you going." <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. Maybe. Maybe like your king of the gods. Though. Yeah. <laughs> a little, a little, a little edge there. Anyways, what else about your story? So, so yes, you brought us to that moment, um, that time, but, but you were inspired by a later war and, and, you know, what she was feeling was universal of all those who are on the home front. I think. And, and, the uh, and the hardships they have mm -hmm. too, because, um, People who go off to war lose, aren't working at their jobs and getting the same salaries. Right. They're living on some kind of allotment, which uh, I don't know what, I have no idea. I can't remember what it was then, but it was not enough. Right. 
and it's probably the same thing now. Right. And if people have kids, there's no one to share share the responsibility and with. Four. Yes. Four of them. She yes. Said. And I don't uh, know if it, was, it was good news or bad news that she was 32. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that kids. wasn't unusual right, that was in those right, days. Right. That was considered a relatively small family. Right. <laughs> and, was, and 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 at 30, my, see my. My mother had me when I was 33, when she was 30, when I was 30. My mother had me when she was 33 because my parents got married during the war. Yeah. And my father wasn't there. Yeah. And so my brother was born in 47 and I was born in 50. Um, so she was rather old. As, as For considering then, old. yeah. Yes. Now it isn't considered that way. Right. But, but I, I think... Um, I think I really like that story, only or part, mostly because of its connection with today's world. Mm -hmm. People are going through this, and I think it. I think I like to tell something where it may tap into someone's emotions, so they have more empathy for mm -hmm. other people going mm -hmm. through this. No matter what, what your feelings were about the the validity of the war, right. or your political feelings, or anything else. Mm -hmm. So I, I think stories can do a lot of that healing kind yes. of stuff for you. And, 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 um, we hope, anyway. We hope. Yes, <laughs> yes. That, that uh, sometimes y you need a receptive ear, but, mm. but I think it, it, your story gives people lots of things to think about that they, they might never have thought about before if they haven't. It, you know, if you've never been in the position you have no idea right. what people are going on. And, and after hearing your story, it isn't the same as being in the position. Nothing is the same as being right. in the position. But it's, they're, they're much more knowledgeable about, about um, the hardships, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the not knowing. And not knowing for six weeks. And, 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 and then the thing of the POWs, never knowing. <laughs> Well, and when you think of the difference oh. today, we people can be emailing one another right. and Skyping and all this stuff. Where, no matter where someone is, they could be. And well, it depends where in the war. That, yeah, that yeah. We have a family friend who's in Afghanistan in a remote area. Well, I'm sure and that's different. His wife gave birth to twins while he was gone, mm. and um, and he doesn't get to communicate a whole lot with with, yeah. with her. Um, well, certainly not a daily basis. Um, well, see, so. that story is for people like her. Yeah. <laughs> that. yeah. Yes. That. Um, but he's due home in November, so. Okay. Well, let's let's go on to coming attractions, and um, because you can see. Betty Cassidy, real live and in person at Proctor's, coming up starting our fifth season at Proctor's in our series called Word Plays. And this, the series is called that because each of the titles of the programs is a word or a, a small phrase and that all of the stories relate to it. And on October 16th at 2 p.m., Betty Cassidy and Fran Combs Berger will be telling stories about excitement <laughs> with an exclamation point, not just excitement, no, excitement. And um, tickets are available at Proctor's box office or on our website, storycircle at proctors.org. Uh, can you give us any hints or tantalize us with anything? Well, we haven't quite finalized our mm -hmm. plans mm -hmm. yet, but I guess I would say it will be wonderful. It will be wonderful. <laughs> Fran, ah. Fran, Fran's tales are very, always very exciting. Yes. She's got tales of hurricanes and all sorts of exciting events. Right. And uh, mine, I hope, will have some, but some excitement in them. I think. For me, the most exciting part is to start a new season of wordplay. Yes. Because I think it's a, a wonderful chance for our storytellers and for a different a different audience that might not get to other things. Mm -hmm. Particularly since it's in the afternoon now. Right. Sunday afternoons at two is when we have word plays. So uh, we invite you all to come. And there's also a coupon, a discount coupon on our website, so you can save four dollars off a ticket. 
But we're on public access and we're not really supposed to talk about ticket prices, so moving right along. Oh, Frank Combs Berger, some of the excitement in her stories might be from when she was growing up in Tornado Alley in Oklahoma. That's right. That's right. So, um, just saying that sounds exciting. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she has some um, stories that hopefully many of us have never experienced a tornado, but she has. And the following Sunday, we usually try to spread these out, but we wanted to be part of the Mohu Festival, the first Mohawk Hudson oh, okay. Valley um, arts extravaganza. So we moved uh, word, your wordplay from earlier in the month so it could be on the last day of Mohu. Um, so on the following Sunday, we're at the Glenn Sanders Mansion again for our storytelling dinner series, where you get four courses of stories interwoven with three courses of food. And on October 23rd will be my other storytelling mentor, Elizabeth Ellis from Dallas, telling stories of heroic women. The actual title is, what, what was her name? Uh, but I thought Stories of Heroic Women is the subtitle, and that would make more sense to emphasize. She'll be sharing stories of, among other people, Peace Pilgrim, who walked over 25,000 miles for peace, mm. and a woman who started the Frontier Nursing Service in the Appalachian Mountains and other heroic women. So that's really a program that's not to be missed. And all you red hat ladies and book clubs, it's, it would be a wonderful opportunity for you to come and have the fellowship of your group around the table when stories are not being told and then enjoying the stories uh, together. And Elizabeth's only here once a year, so that's the time to catch her. Now I'm going to talk about two things that are happening in early November, just in case, um, just because sometimes our program gets uh, broadcast too late in November to pick up these early ones. The first one is part of our free series at Proctor's. We are having four programs this season before events on the main stage. But our events are themed to what's going on at the main stage. For instance, on November 5th at 7 p.m. in Rob Alley, that's that open area, sort of like an indoor piazza across from their, their coffee shop near their box office. In Rob Alley at November 5th at 7 p.m., Margaret French will be telling muddling through humorous stories before Capital Steps appears on the main stage at 8 o'clock. So these are free. You don't have to be going to Capital Steps to come and enjoy it. You can come down uh, before or after dinner or whatever you want to do and enjoy Margaret French, uh, who is a good friend of both of ours and just tells extraordinary stories. Um, and then the other event I want to mention, which is happening the next day, Sunday, November 6th at 2 p.m. up at Cafe Lena, is a fun fundraiser for children at the well. If you watch our program, you've heard us speak of children at the well before. It's an interfaith program for teenagers where they learn to tell stories from their own faith tradition and they, they learn about each other and they have really become friends. It will be the seventh year they'll be starting in January and this is a fundraiser to help support that activity. And we'll be featuring Peggy Lynn, who is a wonderful uh, folk singer and songwriter from the Adirondacks, um, who also, most of her songs are about strong women from the Adirondacks. So if you like heroic women, this is another uh, program to come to also. Now, another way you can experience storytelling is from your very own computer. If you go to our website, storycircleatproctors.org, I know it's long, but story, no, there's no hyphenation or underlining, storycircleatproctors.org, and click on the navigation button that says YouTube, you can watch 42 stories, often have, which have been part of these programs, um, 
on our website. There are over five hours of stories now with 20 different storytellers. And over 3,400 people have watched our stories since February. So I think they like it. And finally, if you want to help, um, you can become a patron of Story Circle at Proctors by going to this website, storycircleatproctors.org slash howyoucanhelp.shtml. It's all written out there. Um, we love being at Proctors because it is a performing arts center, but they do have to charge for their room rent and for their personnel. And if we had help doing that, we could actually pay our storytellers for their hard work. So um, we would greatly appreciate it if you would be willing to become a patron and even just look at the page as the possibility of, of doing that. So I think I'll tell a story Good. now, and then we can talk about Good. that. Good. Um, Betty and I are part of the Academy of Lifelong Learning Storyteller Troop. Um, it's Joe Allen Unger, who is the executive director up in Saratoga Springs, part of Empire State College, now is calling it a Saratoga tradition because in January it will be our fourth storytelling series. It, again, it's a free series that will take place all the Clement Wednesdays, is that a word? Inclement. When it's not inclement. When it's not inclement, <laughs> yes. All the, 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 all the Wednesdays when the schools are open. Uh, Wednesdays at noon at um, 2 Union Avenue or 1? Well, I think it's 1. Yes. It's the newest one. It's the on newest that one that right has that, octagonal, that great big octagonal mm -hmm. bump out. That's where we tell stories noon uh, for six Wednesdays. And we do have a snow day built into the schedule because it sometimes does happen. So Betty Cassidy, um, I will be there, Margaret French, Joe Peck, Betty McCanty, McCanty. and Carol Gregson will be telling in up there. And Joellen, um, when we were talking about that, said, oh, you know, some of those stories you told Kate really early on when you were first associated with us, I really love those and I'd love to hear them again. And so I said, oh, being very flattered that she remembered a story from, from years ago, I said, which ones? And this is the one, one of the ones that is one of her favorites. The war had ended in Germany. World War II, the same war that Betty was talking about. Ilsa was a teenager in a little village there. And Ilsa and everyone else in her village were terrified. They knew one of the, the victorious armies was going to be coming into their village to take over. They had heard horrible stories about each of those armies. They didn't know even which one to hope for to come. Ilse's grandmother was the de facto leader of this tiny village. And she told everyone, when we know the enemy is coming, you come to my home. We will face the enemy together. Eventually, that day happened. Someone saw a long caravan of, of trucks coming towards the village. The word spread. Everyone gathered in Ilsa's grandmother's home. She lit a candle and led them all down to her cellar where they waited. They heard the trucks pull up in front of her home. They heard doors open. They heard banging on her door, her front door open. They heard the boots on the floor above them. Ilsa's grandmother blew out the candle. And they, they heard and they listened and finally she said, I am not going to wait here in the dark to be killed. So she relit her candle and started walking up the stairs, singing her favorite hymn. Ein Fester sehr Gott. And to her utter amazement, 
she was joined by a voice from above, a bulwark never failing. Ilsa said later, as soon as we heard that voice singing our hymn with my grandmother, we knew we were safe. No one would sing a hymn with us and then harm us later. We all rushed up the stairs after her and found American soldiers. What I remember most about them were their songs, their smiles, and their chocolate. Ilsa's story. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> Thank you. And you know what I really loved? I, I mean, I like the whole story and everything, but I loved them. The use of um, hearing things, mm -hmm. the, uh, all the things, because then I could hear them, as you said, the, the boots on the floor and the door scraping and all this stuff. So getting that sensory part of our, our mm -hmm. communication in there, mm -hmm. you really picture those people down in the cellar and can't even imagine what it would feel like. Right. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you've never been in such a situation. Yeah. I certainly have. Yeah. But but the but the the sound part just emphasized that for me, I guess so. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it told so much in just what two minutes or right. something. Right. It, it, yeah. it's, it's just a little bitty story. Uh, but that's minutes. one you're going to think about later. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That I love stories set in history, but I have never liked history classes. Mm. Um, it wasn't until after I graduated from college that I realized. But that I loved biography, and it was only through biography that I understood history. And now I think of it as putting a human face mm -hmm. on what is going on. That I don't understand the facts and figures and the political attitudes. And that doesn't have any meaning for me. But you, you tell me somebody's personal story, and I go, oh, oh. And, and this one I loved because you don't hear many stories of the, the people who lose mm -hmm. and what, what their lives are, are like. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's, uh, I mean, we could read about it mm -hmm. about from an, the historical point of view, sure. but and that's uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But then when you picture this little kid down there, yeah. you really know much better, right. more clearly right. what, what it was like. And, and the chocolate. I mean, the chocolate oh, comes yeah. out in many World War yeah. II stories that a fellow I was talking to up in Mechanicville was a kid during the war, like, like you. And he said he and his friends liked to go down by the, the railroad lines because sometimes there were troop trains going through. And the kids would wave, and the GIs would throw, throw chocolate, chocolate bars out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, I think um, not only for do stories work for historical things? But I think businesses more are, mm -hmm. are all our advertising are, on TV are frankly mostly little stories right. to tell you how wonderful your life will be if you buy this kind of <laughs> shampoo or something. But it's a right. little story trying to urge you to do something. Yes, yes. Or um, I thought it was very powerful when I heard that at Hewlett Packard. Uh, Bill Packard was at a meeting one morning and someone said, I, I, I couldn't finish my assignment because I was working late last night and I needed to get something from the stock room and it was locked. And Bill Packard said, well, we'll see about that. And he got himself uh, some bolt cutters because the stock room just had a, like a fence door with a padlock on it. And he went over and he cut that padlock so it could never be shut again. He said, when my people need something from the stock room, they are going to be able to get it. Now, to me, that told me a lot about him, about his attitude, what he wanted his employees to do. That little, little story. The, the company, oh, they have a word for it. But um, to me, that was, um, I would have been happy to work for him. <laughs> yeah, that's like their new logo or new uh, slogan. Something, slogan, yes. yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. We don't, we don't let petty regulations stand in the way of, of putting out a quality product. Yeah. And I'm not an advertiser. And then I thought a lot about stories, the recent 9-11 um, mm -hmm. thing, where they, re, they went and interviewed so many people who've right. been involved, and they were, they were all telling stories, right. their personal ones, right. yeah. 
So unfortunately, we have to stop telling stories now. Our time is up. But thank you very much for joining us on Story by Story. I hope you come back next month. Thank you. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle. I can't tell you why seasons go.